All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, so, welcome to this uh, special uh, uh, memorial Paul Shoup meeting uh, of uh, the New York Group Series seminar. So, uh, I have to apologize. Today's event will be somewhat improvised, so certain things probably are not going to work. And uh, so, if there are technical glitches, uh, so, uh, so it's. Um, I apologize for those. Uh, so uh, there are. Uh, 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 let me explain uh, sort of the plan uh, so before people start talking. So there are a few uh, uh, pre-selected speakers. Well, some of whom are not here, but I mean some of them who are. And after they uh, uh, finish talking, uh, 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 there will be a period when anyone else you know who wishes to speak will have the opportunity to do so. So it's an open mic period. Uh, so I would ask uh, for those of you who may be uh, new to the New York Group Series Seminar uh, to keep your uh, microphone off uh, uh, on mute. Uh, unless you're talking yourself. And if you already know that you would like to uh, say something during the open mic period, it would be helpful if during uh, the first part where some pre-selected speakers are talking, uh, you send uh, something to me in chat, is a direct message or via public chat. But uh, if you already think that you know uh, that you're going to say something, so it would be helpful for you if you uh, uh, put this information in chat so that they can uh, start, start constructing the queue. So uh, with that said, uh, um, uh, so before we start uh, sort of the formal program, uh, we are pleased to have here today with us uh, 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 Jerome Shoup. So uh, this is Paul's son, and he is going to tell a, a few words uh, uh, before we begin. Jerome, please. Thank you. <laughs> so for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Jerome. I'm uh, Paul's son. Uh, so let me start by thanking Ilya for organizing this uh, seminar in remembrance for uh, my father and uh, thanking kind of all of you in advance for your contributions. Uh, mathematics was without a doubt a great passion for my father. Uh, I'm not a mathematician myself, but I thought I would say a few brief words about um, the privilege that it was to be raised by someone who had such a passion for what they do. Uh, I have many memories of my father talking about mathematics, whether it be with colleagues, laymen's or intellectuals from uh, another field. In all of these, I remember my father's energy, his pleasure at discussing mathematics and his enthusiasm for the possibility of new ideas. And his love of learning, love of discussing ideas, and maybe most importantly, love of doing something that he was passionate about. All of this transmitted uh, to those around him and it was a great influence uh, for me. I did not become a mathematician myself as I don't really have the mindset for research, uh, but my father did not mind. What was really important to him was that I actually loved my job, which uh, I do. And part of my job includes a degree of innovation in predictive modeling within the financial industry. As part of this, my team and I, we generate new ideas, test new models, and think about some of the considerations that come with the use of AI and machine learning. My father and I had an ongoing conversation about these topics. I would tell him about some new algorithms that we were testing and we would discuss like the coding of it. I would get his thoughts on the ethics of machine learning applications and banking when I was developing a new framework for that. I like to think that in that way, I got to experience the taste of what it must have been like to discuss mathematics with my father. In any case, my father transmitted to me the importance of loving what one does, of being curious of new ideas. And I think that these values are a big part of what drives me in my work. Uh, I'm sure that we, he would have no doubt loved this seminar and been an active uh, participant. So um, let me just thank you all again for kind of discussing mathematics in uh, his memory. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jerome. So, um, uh, I'll uh, first say a few words about uh, Paul's mathematical biography. So the rest of the speakers, uh, you are of course, uh, you know, free to do the same. But uh, I wanted to say something uh, a little more formal about Paul's uh, personal mathematical biography before people uh, can start making uh, uh, mathematical and personal remarks uh, of other kind. Um, 
So Paul Eugene Shoup was born in uh, on March 12, 1937 in Cleveland, Ohio. His mother, uh, Vena Shoup, was a nurse. His father, also named Paul, uh, was a factory engineer. Uh, so Paul obtained a bachelor degree uh, from Case Western University uh, in 1959. And after that, uh, he went for PhD studies uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, where he was a student uh, of uh, Roger Linden. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so he obtained his degree uh, there. And immediately after his PhD, so he was first a visiting professor for one year, 1966-1967 academic year at the uh, University of Wisconsin in medicine. And then he came to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. The first year, 1967-68, he was a visiting professor there. He was invited by Bill Boone for a special year in combinatorial group theory. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so um, he stayed on as a regular tenure track faculty member and assistant professor first, you know, then in 1971, he was promoted to associate professor, uh, uh, sorry, in 1968, associate professor, uh, 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 sorry, what am I saying? No, uh, no, 1971, uh, he became associate professor, 1975, full professor. So, and uh, Paul was uh, 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 a faculty member at the University of Illinois uh, for the rest of the, his uh, 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 mathematical career. Uh, he that was his main home. Uh, uh, so he retired from uh, from University of Illinois in 2008 and was appointed Professor Emeritus. Um, while at Illinois, he produced uh, 12 PhD students uh, who, uh, who, for whom he served as the assistant director as an advisor. He received a Guggenheim Fellowship uh, in 1977-78 academic year, and uh, um, of course, as uh, well, most of you, I think all of you know, uh, he was a group theorist. And it, though in those days, in the beginning of Paul's career, the subject was still called combinatorial group theory. Later, it became uh, a geometric group theory. Although Paul himself claimed that he was doing geometric group theory from the start. I'll say something more about this a little later. Uh, and uh, he, uh, being a, a PhD student of uh, Roger Linden, uh, they actually continued their mathematical collaboration. And in 1977, they published a book which became a seminal and definitive uh, uh, work on the subject called Combinatorial Group Theory, which still remains a classic uh, and a kind of iconic text uh, in our field. I think everybody who works in uh, geometric group theory has read it at least some portions of this book. Um, so it's still extremely successful and available for all of us. Uh, and he, uh, Paul's early work in 1970s, uh, uh, can, uh, uh, apart from, of course, uh, uh, writing this book, so it uh, also advanced uh, uh, the use of H&N extensions, which by that time, uh, uh, surprisingly enough, was still a fairly new construction, uh, and also development of small constellation theory, so, uh, which he did in some of uh, his independent papers, some papers uh, joined with Chuck Miller, so Chuck will probably say something about it. Uh, and uh, in 1980s, uh, uh, there were a few years that Paul at least part-time spent in France. So he worked at the University of Paris 7 and also at Bordeaux. And over there, his interests switched a bit more towards uh, uh, computer science, computability theory, uh, computing. Uh, and uh, he also became interested in using computer experiments, um, practical computer experiments as an aid to uh, a theoretical research. So, uh, also during the 1980s, uh, he started his uh, uh, fruitful collaboration with another faculty member at the University of Illinois, Dave Muller. And in particular, in 1983, they wrote, uh, they published this uh, also famous paper uh, with the proof of uh, Muller Schub theorem, you know, about which there is another Wiki Wikipedia article. Uh, so, that's of course the theorem which uh, characterizes. Uh, um, uh, uh, virtually free, uh, uh, finitely generated virtually free groups as exactly those finitely generated groups uh, with context three word problem. Uh, and a bunch of other papers of Dave Muller uh, with Paul uh, can, uh, uh, concerned the development of uh, automata theory, in particular in relation to group theory. In 2000s, when I came as a faculty member to the University of Illinois, uh, uh, so we started uh, our collaboration with Paul and um, wrote 
some papers about genericity in particular there was a paper uh, on that maybe some others will say something about which introduced and explored the notion of generic case complexity which became a kind of independent subject after that uh, so our paper mostly concerns uh, this notion in the context of group theoretic uh, problems but later this notion developed into an independent idea of its own uh, and we wrote a bunch of other papers about uh, generic properties of groups uh, um, uh, so at that time, uh, and our collaboration still remains, you know, extremely important for me. And uh, possibly I'll say some, something about this later if I get to speak uh, during the open mic period. Uh, uh, in uh, 2010s, uh, it's 2010s, uh, so Paul's uh, interest uh, switched more towards uh, uh, computability theory logic. Uh, so Carl Jokos and uh, Dennis Hirschfeld probably will say something about that, and he produced important uh, work in that subject. Uh, and uh, Paul uh, so passed away uh, this year on January 24, 2022 in London, uh, where he, at the time he was living with his son Jerome and Jerome's wife Fiona. So uh, let me, uh, in uh, conclusion, put one slide on, uh, uh, so I'll share the screen again, and while I'm doing that, uh, uh, mention that uh, all the uh, uh, speakers here uh, uh, both, uh, uh, so, oops, sorry. Something. Looking for this again. So uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, anybody who wishes to share the screen uh, uh, will be able to do that, uh, you know, so, and, uh, um, as I said, uh, uh, so one of important themes in uh, Paul's work uh, uh, from uh, his uh, early on in his mathematical career, it concerned the development and applications of small constellation theory, which is still quite an important subject, which is going through a bit of uh, renaissance recently, and there's a lot of new applications and generalizations. But in uh, his paper in 1983, which is called, uh, sorry, 1973, 1973 paper uh, of Paul called a survey on, of small constellation theory. So at the end, in the open uh, problems section, there is uh, open question number five, which reads as follows. What is a small constellation group? What is desired here is a geometric characterization of small constellation groups. For example, the Fuchsian groups are essentially big groups with plain Rakeli diagrams. Uh, the geometric approach to small constellation theory suggests that there should be a characterization of small constellation groups by means of natural geometric properties of the Rakeli diagrams or in terms of their possible actions on other complexes. Such a characterization would bring us full circle back to Dane. So, of course, reading this paragraph uh, now, we see that it was in many ways prophetic and prescient and kind of uh, um, uh, anticipated uh, the development of uh, uh, the notion of uh, word hyperbolic groups and uh, 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 of hyperbolicity more generally, which of course gave birth to the modern phase of geometric group theory. And small constellation theory still remains one of the important uh, uh, roots and sources uh, uh, of hyperbolicity. So, and uh, uh, I think this paragraph here provides a small, but important illustration of uh, Paul's mathematical influence. Uh, and uh, um, so uh, I'll stop here for the moment. Uh, and uh, the other speakers hopefully will say something about the influence uh, of Paul on their work. And if I get to uh, uh, talk later, I'll add a few words from myself. All right, uh, so let me stop sharing. Uh, um, so, um, I think our next speaker, and I believe he is here, uh, is uh, Chuck Miller. Uh, so he was an early collaborator uh, 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 of Paul, uh, uh, so early on during Paul's career. Uh, so hopefully Chuck will say something about that. So Chuck, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's 6 a.m. here in Melbourne, but it's a pleasure to see many of you, old friends. Uh, uh, I wanted to reminisce a bit about how I came to know Paul and and uh, collaborate with him and so forth, uh, which I enjoyed over many years. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I, was, I, I was in Illinois in uh, the, the mid 90s. And uh, when uh, Paul 
as, as Ilya has said, uh, came to Illinois for uh, a year, first of all, as a visiting professor. And uh, before that, uh, uh, Bill Boone had organized for Paul and Don Collins, who was also a student of Bill's, uh, to go to Göttingen for a summer, which was a, a rather mathematical treat at the time. Göttingen is a famous mathematical institute. And, and uh, we, were, uh, we all went, uh, all three of us, and Bill as well. And I think Jens Menike at the time was our host. And uh, so uh, Bill and Paul and I were kind of left on our own to, to our own devices. And so we ran a seminar for each other, the three of us. Uh, and the seminar consisted of us getting around a table and uh, talking about mathematics. And that's where I learned about small cancellation theory with tutorials from Paul and uh, Don Collins was also there and he, he also benefited. And we discussed also uh, HNN things and various other aspects that ended up in my thesis as well as were instrumental in Don's thesis. So Don had just finished his degree at Princeton. And uh, so this was in, in the summer of 1967. And uh, we had a, a really very pleasant social time as well as mathematical time. It was very, uh, very uh, rewarding for all of us, I think. Particularly the social thing, my, my uh, family re remembers this quite fondly because we had, uh, we had uh, my wife and I had purchased a, a Volk, small Volkswagen at the time, which is what one did, and uh, for a trip to Europe. And uh, we, all seven of us actually piled every evening into the car for, for going down to a, a local restaurant for dinner. It was a, a very pleasant social event. Okay, so uh, then the year after, between 60, uh, 67 and 68, uh, we were back in Champaign-Urbana and Paul and I continued to have our seminar going and we started working with each other, just, just basically having a seminar. I was telling him the stuff that I was working on and he was telling me about small cancellation theory and stuff he was working on. So we had a very uh, uh, good interaction and we also took up paddle ball, which is a, a variation of squash played with a different, different paddle and a bigger ball. But anyway, we uh, we took up this athletic event. So that, that went that went along quite pleasantly until until I actually uh, well for for a year or so, and uh, it went along quite well until I broke my toe against a wall. So this is a hazard of playing squash like paddle ball. Um, anyway. Uh, uh, so Paul and I did some collaborative work, and he gave a talk about it in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that uh, that uh, that summer, the summer of '68, and uh, then in '69 uh, we uh, well, I, I I I was there as a regular instructor, and and uh, uh, finished my thesis and. And uh, Paul and I had a collaboration going and toward the end of that year. We, we came up with this argument for, uh, for, pro for, uh, um, for geometrically proving uh, Britain's lemma and dealing with HNN extensions, which is actually it's reproduced in Linden Shoup. So uh, you can all read it there. It's, it's a very, very, I think a very instructive thing. It's not, not a new result in the sense that uh, Britain's lemma was already well known, and Collins, Collins' lemma was also uh, known to Don Collins and us. And uh, but the geometric interpretation is very enlightening, and this is a theme of Paul's that he he really liked to look at things geometrically, and that was uh, very insightful in many ways in many contexts. His insistence upon thinking about things geometrically and the method of diagrams. Um, let's see. Um, I wanted to mention. Uh, so okay. So that was all uh, for a, for a graduate student. This was quite. Uh, it was my final year as a graduate student. That was a, a really uh, good thing. I was very uh, since I interacted so much with Paul and and Don Collins and some other people. I was quite confident that my thesis was a correct, which is a good thing. 
and uh, and uh, and uh, B was even interesting. So uh, that is, we had a good good interaction. Um, then the following year, I went to the institute in Princeton, and Paul went to the the Courant Institute at NYU, and we still continued our interaction a bit, which was uh, was quite nice. Um, uh, and I think that's the time we actually wrote up some of these things we've been working on, and we we in in the end uh, published three papers together, which was uh, you know at the time there were only two of them. One came much later. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, other things I wanted to mention. Oh yes, okay. So so um, anyway, Paul was very uh, very. Um, very helpful in promoting promoting uh, my mathematical interaction with the people at the Courant, which was good at the time. And I think he he invited me there on a couple of occasions. And I got to know Magnus, for instance, and uh, 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 and and the group theory seminar, which was quite uh, quite useful over the, over many years. I had uh, okay. So. Um, uh, that was uh, sort of the, the time th things. After that, I, I moved to Melbourne and Paul visited here once and so forth, but we didn't, uh, we didn't, uh, um, we didn't live, live proximate, we would live close together. So our, our collaboration kind of uh, uh, just cooled off a bit. That's fine. Uh, we, we, every time I would visit him, he would, uh, of course, give me instruction in what he was working on. He, he was a very, um, very focused and intense person about his research, and he and also very, uh, very good at in, uh, teaching and uh, tutorial style instruction, where he would explain what he was interested in doing to you, uh, uh, in, particularly in geometric terms. And I was enjoyed interacting. And we had a, our families had a social interaction uh, at the time and, and subsequently as well. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, yes. Um, okay. I just uh, I wanted to 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 mention a, a few th a few curious things about Paul, which you may or may not be aware of. I'm sure Jerome is, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, Paul was, uh, he was, of course, as I mentioned, intensely interested in mathematics, but he was also interested in many other things. He was intellectually very, very interested in a wide variety of topics. And in, one of the surprising things to me was always that he was so interested in languages. He seemed to enjoy trying to learn a language, in particular Russian, and well, Greek, uh, Greek, first of all, Greek and Russian and French and even Italian, I think, eventually. And uh, uh, so, but he, he, he thought this was great sport and he quite enjoyed it. Uh, I, I mentioned Greek because uh, throughout his, uh, throughout the time I knew him, he, he clearly had Greek uh, uh, connections with a, a Greek family in, in Cleveland that he, uh, saw occasionally that that he would uh, if he were in the nearby uh, neighborhood he would ring them up and try to get in touch with them and try to see them if he could and he uh, he spoke a, a bit of greek as well uh, a fair amount actually and uh, he was also involved eventually in the greek orthodox church to some extent that is uh, he was uh, which all of which surprised me eventually uh, but nonetheless, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I'm not sure about the, not clear about his childhood. The situation was he described it pretty vaguely to me that he, when he was growing up, he, he had a sort of this Greek family sort of took him in as a second family. And uh, he was uh, uh, very attached to them. And, and I don't know, didn't, he never actually explained very much about what went on, but he was Clearly, culturally affected by by the, his inclusion in their in their orbit, so to speak, which is very nice. Um, let's see uh, what else can we say. Uh, yes, okay. 
Uh, uh, one uh, other comment about uh, so uh, comment about his thing. He, he enjoyed uh, he, he really liked geometry and the diagrammatic methods and applying it to group theory. But he also uh, was always keen to uh, to do things in a, in the most elegant and efficient way he could he could find. He, he enjoyed uh, interpreting things geometrically. He also enjoyed uh, uh, um, doing theories in a particularly elegant way, if he could see a way of improving the way things were done. And this was something that the a theme that kind of recurred when he was interested in a topic, he would, oh, well, that's the way to do this and so forth. And that was a very, uh, he, he was often very insightful because you had to understand a bit more about a subject in order to, to be quite elegant about it. Um, Anyway, uh, later, later in life, I saw him several times in France and so forth, but we never lived close together, so didn't have quite such a collaborative thing going eventually. But nonetheless, it was, knowing him was a very rewarding thing and, and uh, enjoyed his company over many years. And uh, so uh, I miss him. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, so now uh, I'd like to uh, um, pass the microphone to uh, David Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer, who um, was a PhD student of Paul. So he graduated uh, with his PhD, I believe, in 1992. And that was, of course, also at the University of Illinois. And he is now a professor at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. Dave, if you're here, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope my computer stays on. It it's it shut off for a second there, so hopefully things will stay good here. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm honored to be um, invited to say something about Paul. Um, thank you, Ilya, for inviting me. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, I was um, Paul's student at the University of Illinois in um, 1992, and that was, um, you know, shortly after all this stuff in the late 80s with um, Gromov doing the hyperbolic groups and, um, and and she really sort of felt that that was sort of an extension of of the of what Dane had done in the 1910s, and um, and the small cancellation theory. He really felt he was he was thrilled by it actually that this because this was the simpler view. Um, just like Chuck had just mentioned, this was the simpler view of the small of a lot of the small cancellation theory kind of stuff that he had been working on. So he was really excited about that and Thurston stuff and Epstein and those folks working on. Um, on automatic groups. He loved that because it was a computational sort of logic side. Um, he was always excited when, um, when, when algebra and geometry and logic sort of got mixed together. So you had this language theory and you had graphs and diagrams. He was really excited by that. Um, and did like it when he could explain something and give you a nice picture that explained it easily. He loved those elegant sort of solutions. Um, so I, I wanted to say a couple of traits. I wrote down some traits. I, I wrote down here that he had a childlike enthusiasm for math. He was just always excited when he, whenever I would talk to him about something, it was like, okay, here's this exciting thing I've been working on. And I, I'd see him at conferences where I know he had talked to, to 100 people about that, but then he was still, when he saw me, he was just thrilled to let me know about it. And, and I was thrilled to hear it. It was, um, it, was, it was great to talk to him about mathematics. Um, um, he always liked pictures. I have written down here that he always did like pictures when a diagram could be used. Um, you know, I did talk to him at one time, you know, early on, you know, doing my research. Do you talk to people about your research or do you keep that secret so that, you know, people don't know you're working on this problem? He was always open to you tell everybody what you're doing because you're just going to learn more and more by talking to people about stuff and being open. And he, so I like that about his sort of philosophy of doing math and sharing it. Um, I can say when... Um, when I saw him later um, at conferences, um, he, uh, the stuff about generic algorithms, he just loved that. He would talk about that over and over, and um, it was great to hear about that. Uh, he did come visit Asheville in, um, in I, I'm, I'm trying to remember what year, I think in between 2005 and 2010, he came to visit once and gave a short talk um, at a, um, an REU we were running here on campus. and. Uh, and um, I'm excited about Dane and have written about Dane. So I was excited he came out and we went to uh, 
the Black Mountain College campus and saw Dan, it went to Dane's grave and visited. And I was excited to be able to take him there because um, I know how much he was interested in Dane and I've written so much about Dane too. So that's sort of, I guess his legacy to me is he, that he brought that passion for the history of combinatorial group theory and, um, and geometry and group and um, all the history of what's happened in topology recently. And um, so I, that I've been very excited about. So um, I got that from him. Um, so I, I just wanted to say a couple of words. Um, I'm, um, I think that's all really I needed to say. Leon, th thanks for letting me say something. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave. So I believe that uh, Alexei Masnikov is still not here. Uh, so we'll skip over him. And our next uh, speaker is going to be uh, Carl Jokos, also from the University of Illinois, who was both a colleague and collaborator uh, of Paul, especially in uh, the last 10 years. So he will probably say something about their work. Carl, are you here? Carl? Yes. Uh, Carl, uh, you're still on mute, so we cannot hear you. I'm not sure if you're speaking. All right. Uh, yeah, okay. Now so, uh, I'm indeed uh, honored to speak about Paul, and my slides don't want to advance here. Ah, here we go. Uh, and uh, certainly thank you very much, Ilya, for organizing this uh, seminar. And I'm very interested also to hear the other speakers. Uh, Paul and I both came to the University of Illinois in 1967. Just a minute here, I have some problem with the pictures. I need to adjust the view here. Ah. Oh, well. Um, we both came the same year he had just a temporary appointment, but uh, life in those days was very informal. The head, Paul Bateman, uh, asked if he would like to stay on another year and he said yes. And so he ended up spending his whole career there and I also spent my career there at University of Illinois. And we had all sorts of interesting conversations uh, about mathematics and many other topics as other Jerome and other speakers have mentioned, he was passionate about so many things. Uh, architecture, he loved to go see uh, homes by famous architects, music, uh, various kinds, art, languages has been mentioned, travels all over the world. He did Tai Chi with great enthusiasm. And he was also a great cook. He's a, truly a Renaissance man, as Ilya has said. Um, and he worked on, um, as has been mentioned, a, a whole wide variety of topics met with collaborators from all over the world, as well as uh, with Dave Muller here on automata theory and formal languages. And Paul and I enjoyed discussing mathematics and he, he told me about the mysteries of uh, group theory and so on, but somehow I didn't really get into it uh, until one day in 2009, he came to my office and told me about a paper he had with the three people here today, Ilya, Alexei, and Vladimir, and um, generic complexity and decision problems in group theory and random walks from Journal of Algebra. And um, there it was shown that many uh, finitely presented groups where the word problem looks really bad, it's of high complexity or even undecidable, it becomes easy if you just ask your decision procedure to work on a set of, dense, of words of density one. So the bad cases, there are bad cases, but they're, so to speak, few and far between. Um, so uh, roughly speaking, there's an algorithm which quickly solves the, um, the um, problem on a set of words of density one. Um, and then Paul said, well, why don't we not just consider word problems, but go on and look at arbitrary sets of natural numbers. 
And as a computability theorist, this was right down my line. And uh, so we, we, we started working on this. Um, I'll give some precise definitions, although they may not be necessary. Uh, first for density, uh, to get the density of a set A, you first consider the density of A below N, which is the fraction of numbers below N, which are elements of A, which A is a set of natural numbers. And then you just take the limit of this as N goes to infinity, that's the density of A if the limit exists. And then um, a set of natural numbers A is generically computable. If there's an algorithm which outputs the same value as the characteristic function of A on its domain, and its domain has density one. So this algorithm cannot make any mistakes, but it may sometimes run forever. In other words, diverge. And a sort of dual notion is a set A is coarsely computable. If there's a total computable function, which agrees with A on a set of density one. So this is just the reverse. It, it can give wrong answers, but it can never diverge. Of course, in both cases, it must give the correct answer with density one. Then we wrote a joint paper on this, um, which appeared in the Journal of the London Math Society in 2012. And we explored these basic notions and the implications between them. For example, neither of them implies the other, even for computably enumerable or recursively enumerable sets, whatever you want to call them. Uh, Carl, sorry oh, yes. for interruption. Uh, I wanted to see if we can, uh, uh, because we're still only seeing the first page of your slides. Uh, so, uh, uh, oh, uh, you're still on the first page. Yes, uh, I don't know. I mean, oh. uh, I think uh, oh, you may be seeing something, but we are only seeing the first page. Uh, well, I'm saying it. Oh my, I don't know. So uh, uh, maybe you can go to like a full screen view, uh, you know, or something like see. that um, in your PDF. Your sharing is paused. So oh, I'll do it. Stop share and stop share. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm clicking now. Okay, yes. now I'm going to share again. But, but I think once you share, you uh, you have to change the full, to full screen view uh, in your PDF file. I think otherwise. I probably. did. I, I see it. I saw it on my screen in full screen. Uh, full screen. I see that. Not for us. Okay. We could do it again. Uh, but let's see. Um, I will click this, and then I will click share. And now. Okay. Now, now, we, we, uh, now it's good. Yes. Um, I don't know if there's any point in showing the previous slides. Hmm. Probably not. Um, but. <laughs> So sorry about that. Um, so this paper was followed by an explosion of papers on these topics and their generalizations and on related reducibility concepts where uh, each of these notions, basic notions I described gives rise to a notion of reducibility between sets. And there are way too many to summarize here. But, um, Rather than trying to uh, describe these paper, I'll just say what they involve connections with. Let me ask, can you see now this, uh, my slides okay? Yes. Uh, so of course with classical computability theory, uh, that's uh, of the essence, but then effective randomness came in to many of them. And it also gives some insight into effective randomness. Uh, coding theory, uh, there's error correcting codes, graph theory, topology, descriptive set theory, reverse mathematics, and even metric spaces, as uh, Dennis will discuss in his talk. And Paul was a co author of many of these papers, but many other people were involved also. And um, his ideas, his uh, not, not only his basic ideas, but his ideas as the subject developed in the direction it should go were a great inspiration for all of them. And indeed, this is an ongoing project and there's still many interesting open questions which, uh, which remain to be worked on. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you. Uh, all right. So um, uh, yes, and our next speaker it, it will be Dennis Hirschfeld from University of Chicago, who was uh, also uh, a collaborator of Paul and I think on several of these places of Carl as well uh, on the uh, on the topic that Carl uh, has just told us about. And Dennis will continue. Dennis, are you here? Yes, I am. Thank you. Yes, it's a it's an honor to be part of this um, celebration of Paul's life and, and work. Um, I got to know Paul and to have the opportunity to collaborate him through Carl and, and this work that he was talking about. Uh, and it was it was really delightful to get to know him and his <laughs> wide range of knowledge and, and enthusiasm for so many things, mathematics, of course, but as people have talked about languages and travel and music and literature and so many things. Um, you know, it, a lot of times it's like the little things that, that stick with you. Uh, I uh, remember when Paul started going to the, coming to the um, Midwest Computability Seminar, I remember the kind of real joy that he had at the fact that we had actually good coffee in the coffee breaks. And he expressed that. And of course, that's nice as someone who also appreciated good coffee. But more generally, it's, it's just great to be able to, in, to have interacted with someone who, who so clearly loved the things that he loved, right? And I think that's a really important characteristic. Uh, so let me, uh, in, and so in mathematics too, of course. So let me share uh, my screen here. And um, let's see. Okay. So does that look okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> I want to talk about our last paper together. So Carl and Paul and I, uh, and this is actually paper is still out uh, being refereed. So pretty recent. Uh, and as you can see, it's a pretty long uh, title because lots of things ended up coming into it, but it comes out of this really great idea that Paul had that it took him telling me about it several times before I kind of could see what he was getting at, but his intuition was just so great that some that something interesting should come from this. So uh, the, so this comes from the, this notion of density of a set of, of natural numbers that, uh, that uh, Carl uh, alluded to. You can look at the upper density of just the number of elements in the set up to divided by n to take the one soup. And that can be used to give a notion of distance between two sets of natural numbers. <clears throat> you just look at their symmetric difference and, and the density of that, the upper density of that. <laughs> now, this is not exactly a metric because it's possible for two different sets to have distance zero. We call them coarsely equivalent in this case, but of course you do the usual thing. You mod out by the, the set of coarsely equivalence classes and then you do get a metric. And this metric is well known. It's often called the Besicovich metric and has interesting uh, topological properties. We say a little bit about this in the, in the paper. But what Paul saw here is that this there should be something really interesting to say by using this metric to give a notion of distance, not just between individual sets, but between Turing degrees. Between So a Turing degree is just an equivalence class <laughs> where two sets are equivalent if each can be used to compute the other, right? So degrees of equicomputability. And so he thought that there should be something meaningful there because, well, this metric is bounded, of course, by one. So if you take the Hausdorff distance, and it's the usual sense of distance between sets of metric space. You take the points in one set, look at the supreme of their distances to point in the other set, take the other set as well, take the max of the two, and that gives you a notion of distance. And it's a metric by usual you know, general stuff. It's a metric on the closed subsets of the space. So then Paul's idea was, okay, so if you take a Turing degree, you can look at the set of course equivalence classes of the elements of, of this Turing degree. And then you can define a distance between Turing degrees to be the distance between these sets or the closures of the set, so you stay in that in that metric space. And this actually, so one can show and show in the paper that uh, the only way that the that these um, closures can be the same is if the degrees are the same. So if you have different degrees, you have different closures, and therefore, in fact, you get a metric space here. <laughs> so okay, so you get a metric space, and if you kind of look at the definition, you can see that what this is getting at is how difficult is it for sets in one degree to approximate sets in a different degree in the sense of this distance, right, of this Vesikovich distance. Uh, but, you know, it's a definition, but the question is, is this meaningful? And Paul had, I think, this great intuition that, yes, this should have some meaning. And the one, and there's, you know, several things we explore in that in the paper, but one thing that's really interesting about this metric space, and, you know, perhaps quite surprising, <coughs> is that it's a three-value metric space. If you take two different Turing degrees, there's only two possible distances between two different Turing degrees, one half or one. 
And this comes out of adapting a uh, result of Manan's for this thing called the, the coarse computability bound. And this uses, Manan's result uses results in coding theory. Uh, and so when you get that right, then you start thinking, okay, so if there's only these two possible distances, they should have some kind of meaning, you know, should mean something if two things have distance half, two distance one. And, and, you know, there's a lot to say there, but one connection that I found really productive is that it ties into something that shows up in different guises in computability theory, which is the interaction between being typical in the sense of category and being typical in the sense of measure. So we have these notions and the details don't matter, but notion of being weakly one generic relative set. So that just means that B is sufficiently typical in the sense of category, or if you're coming at it from, from that point of view, you can see this as an effectivization of saying that B is co-generic relative to A. Uh, and in this case, the distance has to be one. On the other hand, you have this notion of one randomness, which is an effectivization of randomness. It's also known as Martin Love randomness. People might have heard of that. And it's, it's an effectivization of the notion of being random. It means essentially not being in any easily describable set of measure zero, being typical in the sense of performable statistical tests. And if A and B are officially random to each other, the distance is half. So there's this, this kind of connection there. And this has been like really productive. And I think there's still a lot to say, but we say some things about that in the paper. And all of this came because Paul was sure that this distance, this kind of this, this, this metric had to have some meaning for, for training degrees. And he was completely right. Uh, and it's just, it was just such a pleasure to be able to be part of this and, and, and to work with him. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Uh, oops, sorry. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, can you? Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, all right. Uh, and uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Vladimir Shpilerain uh, uh, from the City College of CUNY, and he also was a, a collaborator of Paul on several papers. And hopefully, he's here. Vladimir, are you here? I'm here. Yes. Okay, go ahead, please. Can you see me? Yes, uh, yeah. Your picture is moving, but we, we can see you. Yes, I have moved my chair so that you could see me. All right, so um, I had the privilege of knowing two classics of group theory, Gilbert Baumslag and Paul Shoup. Uh, I think I knew, I knew them both rather well. And uh, well, it's inevitable that uh, I sort of try to compare them, at least in my head. Uh, they both are, were of about the same age. Gilbert was just a few years older. Uh, personally, they were very different, which is not surprising given their different backgrounds. Mm. Ohio and uh, South Africa, in 1940s were as different as it gets. So Gilbert was uh, flamboyant and was uh, a center of uh, social life. Paul was not flamboyant and was not center of social life. But uh, two important things that they had in common, I think was one thing was their passion for mathematics. Uh, I think uh, several people already talked about that. And the other thing they had in common was their excitement uh, when they heard about new ideas. So they were never dismissive or critical. Uh, they never downplayed the significance of a new idea. Uh, <clears throat> they always met new ideas with excitement and uh, <clears throat> started to, to think about how this idea can be useful, what else can be done in this direction and so on. This is a very important quality, I think, and uh, this the quality that many people these days are missing. Uh, and of course, uh, <clears throat> another thing about Paul is that what Chuck already mentioned is how Paul appreciated the beauty of mathematics. Uh, that's another thing that is uh, rare these, these days. Uh, these days, the, the emphasis shifts to the amount of work uh, which is in line with what is happening in the society in general, especially in the corporate world where employers uh, 
tend to pay to the to their employees for the amount of work rather than for the results. Uh, in mathematics, uh, we still see some results occasionally, uh, even though the amount of work is getting more and more important. Mm -hmm. There's even a euphemism for that, like uh, deep work, deep paper, which means the number of pages is in double digits or better yet in triple digits. And the beauty has often gone uh, so beauty is becomes more and more an old school thing. Sorry, as uh, my battery is dying. Not my battery, the battery of my phone. Um, and I think uh, Paul was definitely one of those who uh, really appreciated and cherished uh, the beauty of uh, mathematics, group theory, and, uh, theoretical computer science, and the relations between these two areas that he appreciated mostly. Okay, uh, Paul will be missed greatly. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, so now uh, uh, I'd like to uh, pass the microphone to uh, Tulio Cicarini Silberstein, so who is also uh, a collaborator of Paul. Uh, they wrote uh, several papers together. I think all of them probably were uh, joined with Michelle Kurner. If not, Tulio will correct me. So Tulio, please. Tulio, are, are you there? Oh yeah, I forgot to switch on the mic. Switch off yeah. the mic. So thank you, Ilya, for um, for um, organizing this uh, nice memorial. I really enjoyed the previous uh, talks. Uh, I really, I was really uh, refilling all these emotions about uh, Paul's friendship uh, and uh, how much he contributed to. He gave me so so much, not only mathematical ideas. He was a uh, magnificent cook. He was a great artist. I, I like when Vladimir said that, that he liked beauty. So, but not only in mathematics, in art. Uh, he brought me to uh, to the museum uh, in uh, Chicago. We visited so many museums together in Italy and abroad. Uh, we were together in Romania, and he went fortunately alone because I could not arrange that way to visit some. Mm, monastery which were painted outside so very peculiar and we shared a lot of readings beautiful books like um, la des de petite victoire a, a sort of uh, autobiography of um, kurt gödel's wife and we had uh, so many deep um, uh, uh, discussions about many, many things. So I want just to say some something, he has also some humor. So I, I will just finish by saying that once I asked to my cousin, what was uh, the poem, the poetry in, uh, in Hebrew? You know, in Greek you, and in Latin, you have the, you, you have some sort of music when you read, uh, you know, all this uh, metric. And in, in Italian or even uh, Shakespeare, you have uh, rhymes. Okay, he told me that in, uh, in uh, Jewish, like, like in the Bible, you, you, you repeat the concept twice, of course, with other words, but you repeat the same thing. And so while discussing about something with Paul, I mentioned this. And then when we were write something, again, because of this search of beauty, maybe we would write something first in words and then maybe with a formula or may, maybe they are in the other order. And Paul would say every time, so let's do some Jewish poetry. And I was always laughing and because we really liked this aspect of putting you know, beauty in mathematics. Even in writing, there is a beauty and I really appreciate this, um, this point of view. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Tulio. Uh, so now uh, uh, we are 
basically uh, uh, going to switch to the open market period. But before that happens, I will say a few more words about Paul of a personal nature. And while I'm speaking, uh, so if somebody uh, thinks that they definitely want to say something uh, about Paul during the open mic period, it would be useful if you uh, put a note about this in chat, uh, you know, so. Uh, so uh, let me uh, sort of abuse my uh, privilege here as the organizer and say a few extra words uh, about Paul, as I said, of a personal nature, because Paul was both a, a collaborator, a, a personal friend, and a mentor for me. Uh, uh, so my decision to come uh, uh, to the University of Illinois uh, uh, as a faculty member, I had a few other offers at the time, of course, was greatly influenced uh, by Paul's presence there. I, I knew that Paul was a classic, uh, you know, I knew the Lyndon and Schub book, I've read some of his papers, but I've never met him before. And uh, uh, so during my initial visit, uh, uh, you know, uh, so the recruitment visit, uh, you know, that, that's when I met Paul, and he, he, he impressed me greatly, uh, uh, sort of, uh, as a person. And uh, I want to mention a few uh, uh, traits that uh, some other speakers here already commented on that also uh, I greatly appreciated uh, in Paul. He was, as somebody mentioned here, I don't remember whether it was Chuck or somebody else, Paul was very much a Renaissance man, in particular in relation to mathematics. He had very broad interests uh, and he had great enthusiast, enthusiasm about mathematics, which was in fact uh, uh, not limited to geometric group theory or to group theory. He was of course uh, very excited about his work, about the work of others. He was extremely mathematically generous. He really liked the results of other people. and. Uh, but uh, uh, he was also very interested in things that went far beyond uh, uh, group theory as such. So uh, at the University of Illinois, there is a, a mathematical library, which is right in the building. And uh, sort of every day or every week, there would be some new book arrivals. And Paul would look through all of these books and then you know, would get excited about many of them. And uh, later on, you would have uh, extremely interesting and stimulating conversations uh, where Paul would usually be talking and he would be telling me about this uh, uh, great new book that he found on the uh, bookshelf. And it could be about something that had nothing to do with group theory. It, uh, it could be differential geometry uh, or in fact, uh, physics or something else. Uh, you know. And uh, um, he also was, I think, the only faculty member I knew um, uh, in our in, in department who went to just about every colloquium talk at the time, uh, you know, regardless of the topic. So he had extremely broad mathematical interests. So he really wanted to know about what was going on in, in mathematics uh, in the broadest sense. And as others mentioned here, uh, uh, this Renaissance uh, uh, man, Renaissance person uh, kind of attitude uh, towards a life and knowledge, uh, extended far beyond mathematics. So Paul uh, was interested in languages. So he continued to learn languages until the very end of his life. Uh, uh, every time that he would, uh, so he, he, uh, he knew, uh, he learned, of course, he spoke French fluently, but he also knew a fair amount of Greek, uh, Russian, uh, Italian, Spanish, uh, a little bit of Hebrew. Every time he would go to any new country for a significant amount of time, he would try to learn at least a certain amount of language. He actually spoke some Mandarin Chinese at least a little bit, uh, you know, at the level of some phrases. So I, I mean, that always amazed me. And, also greatly admired that about Paul. Uh, and he, one of his favorite books uh, was this novel, uh, uh, Shogun, uh, uh, and, uh, by uh, uh, James uh, Clavel. And th this novel, apart from being pretty long uh, and kind of exciting, you know, it also has been translated to many, many languages. So whenever Paul would start learning a new language, he would also uh, try to get to the point where he can read Shogun in that language and he definitely read it in Russian, I know that for sure. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and uh, Paul was excited about music, so his musical interests uh, were quite broad, but he introduced me personally to some kind of music, uh, some certain kinds of music that I was never exposed before, uh, you know, so bluegrass, jazz, various other things, and the music that was playing here at the very beginning before uh, this uh, seminar started was Gregorian chants, uh, you know, which is uh, uh, also something that Paul liked. He always uh, claimed to me that this is the perfect uh, uh, morning exercise music, for instance, <laughs> you know, breakfast music. So <laughs> it found a little strange, but in any event, you know, for those of you who don't know, Paul really liked Gregorian chants. Uh, uh, and that's why I played uh, Gregorian chants in the very beginning uh, of this presentation. Uh, 
uh, and uh, 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 as somebody else mentioned, Paul was also fairly serious about religion, so he was close uh, uh, as a boy growing up to this uh, uh, Greek family, uh, to the extent that they, in some sense, partially adopted him, and uh, for that reason, he became immersed, uh, substantially immersed in Greek language, Greek culture, so he, uh, he was a Greek Orthodox uh, Christian, uh, and also he liked to de uh, describe himself, he always told me that he is one third Greek. <laughs> which of course if you think about it is mathematically impossible but nevertheless he insisted that that was the case so uh, as i said you know i can tell you many stories about paul but i don't want to monop uh, monopolize the time uh, uh, let me nevertheless mention that in mathematical terms uh, i mean paul was an important uh, uh, collaborator and also a mentor for me i learned a great deal from him in particular about uh, uh, computational complexity about computing and about using computer experiments as a substantive tool in guiding research so paul was actually quite passionate about computation and he liked programming he always programmed in fortran 90 which he insisted my tulio probably knows about this is the best language of programming if you want to sort of do some quick computations uh, so I cannot program a line in Fortran 90, but at the time, you know, so Paul taught me a little bit and I, uh, um, uh, uh, whenever we needed to program something for our papers, Paul would do the programming. In return, I learned, uh, I taught him how to use LaTeX. So this was my first uh, and only probably contribution to, uh, to Paul's technological literacy, because in the very beginning, uh, I remember uh, of our, uh, I mean, this was probably even before we started writing papers together, but we would often go to lunch uh, uh, together and after uh, maybe it was the first or the second uh, year of me being at Illinois, after we were coming back from lunch and came to the mail room, as we usually did, uh, so Paul came to his mailbox and got out his own paper, which was printed out. Uh, this was a paper of, on perimeter reduction. So, uh, and uh, he became very excited. So seeing this, uh, his own paper, you know, printed out, uh, you know, so uh, in his mailbox. And I couldn't understand what was happening. Why was Paul so excited to see his own paper? I mean, you just send it to the printer, right? <laughs> you know, so, so you compile the text file and send it to the printer. So that's what I thought. Uh, and it turned out that at the time, Paul wasn't uh, yet using LaTeX and we had a secretary in the department to whom you could give your manuscripts, uh, uh, handwritten manuscripts, and she would typeset it in tech, and that's what that paper was. So after that, uh, I quickly converted Paul to, uh, um, uh, to actually writing papers in LaTeX, and of course, you know, I myself learned a great deal more from him than that. So he became, uh, as I said, a mentor, a collaborator, a very good friend, and I'll miss him very much. All right, uh, so uh, that's what I wanted to say. So now uh, we move from uh, to the official open mic session. So if anybody else wants to say something, so you can either raise your hand or just uh, sort of uh, uh, indicate that you want to talk and I'll we'll try to accommodate those people who want to say something. So um, is there anyone else uh, who wants to say? something about Paul. Uh, ah, I see that uh, there is something from Bob Gilman. Uh, so, okay, Bob, are you here? I am here. Can you hear me? Bob? Yes, I can hear you. I think that uh, Bob might be having a difficulty with his... Uh, this is Mike, one moment. Uh, Bob, we still cannot hear you. Are you there? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so, okay. Now we can hear you. I still cannot see you, but uh, in any event, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Now we can hear you and we can see you. So I think before. Uh, okay. The... Well, good. That's, that's we, we, can see, uh, we can see the top of your head, the, the top. Oh, half. well, yes. That's um, unfortunately. Let me try okay. to. Uh, better. Uh, yes. Better. Okay. Thank Maybe. you. Um, Okay, I um, I just wanted to share a, a, a small remembrance of Paul, who um, I guess I should say that I got to know him probably um, certainly after um, reading the Mueller shoot paper, and then we had many mathematical conversations, and 
uh, unfortunately never progressed to a, a collaboration, although we discussed it several times. Uh, but as someone said, Paul was a serious person and he was serious um, about his teaching. And uh, he, I remember, and maybe some of you have heard this because I'm sure he shared this with other people, an experience he had while teaching an undergraduate class, presumably in Illinois, maybe a calculus class. And I can't remember um, exactly how this started, but one of the students in the class mentioned Frankenstein and made the usual uh, or common mistake of, of confusing Frankenstein with the monster. Frankenstein was, as we know, the creator of the monster. So Paul, who thought things should be done correctly, um, assigned his class a little essay to discuss uh, Frankenstein and to write a little book report and to say something about the author of that uh, novel, uh, Mary Shelley. And the students didn't pay attention. So the next time Paul uh, said, okay, not only did they have to write a book report and, and discuss the life of uh, Mary Shelley, but they should also discuss the accomplishments of her husband, um, <laughs> a well-known uh, English poet. And they didn't take this too seriously either. So then this, the next time he said, not only should they do all these other things, but they should also write an essay on the English romantic poets. And this went on through several iterations until apparently the class was uh, browbeaten into actually responding correctly. And it is um, one of the things that I, it's a sort of characteristic of Paul in, in the, the, that he had this sort of, I don't know, formality. Things should be done. I mean, not in any kind of, um, well, except when talking to students, prescriptive way, but, but uh, for students, yes, maybe. There were things that they should do. If you're gonna mention Frankenstein, you should actually get the reference correct. So that, that's my remembrance. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, so I think I have a note from John Mickin that he wanted to say something. So John, uh, are you here? Uh, yes, I could say just a, a few words. Um, so I, uh, as perhaps some of you know, or most of you know, um, I come from a different mathematical tradition. I come from semi-group theory. But I met Paul, I think, in Paris uh, the first time, and I was very inspired by by his geometric ideas and so on. And it's been extremely influential in, in my work. And I've tried to introduce a lot of geometric ideas in semi-group theory. And so we met at many, many conferences and we would always uh, have very interesting conversations. And he was, he was very intellectually generous and, and would, 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 was very interested in what I was doing as, as, as was I in what he was doing. But I do remember one small incident a uh, non-mathematical incident that I thought might be of interest to, to some of you. It was a sort of a small adventure that we shared in Jerusalem, actually. Um, there was a conference in Israel, perhaps it was in 2000, but I, I can't remember exactly what year it was. Anyway, Paul and I found ourselves in Jerusalem on, uh, on Shabbat, uh, one um, <clears throat> one day. And uh, Jerusalem, as most of you know, if you've been there, uh, more or less closes down during Shabbat. And, and Paul and I were not completely sure what we were going to do, but we decided that we would, I think we were staying in the same hotel. So we decided, well, we would just walk into the old city and look around in the old city. So we went into the old city and then we, we thought, well, I wonder if it's possible to go to, to Bethlehem. And uh, Paul had never been to Bethlehem. I had never been to Bethlehem. So we thought, well, how would we, how would we manage to do this? So we decided that what we would do is we would just walk out through the, the Damascus gate and go to the bus station outside the Damascus gate and see if we could just simply get a bus. To, to go to Bethlehem. So it was a bit of an adventure because neither of us, I, I, Paul is, is very adept at languages as we know, but I don't believe he spoke very much Arabic uh, at the time, which was what I think we needed to speak outside the, the, the Damascus gate. But uh, we went there and there were a lot of buses and uh, we kept, we started asking people, Bethlehem, Bethlehem. And so finally we found a bus 
that uh, would take us uh, to near Bethlehem. So we um, got on the bus. It was uh, a few cents, <laughs> I think it cost. We went and we were dropped off outside the, outside the city and people said, oh, go that way and so on. So we wandered into Bethlehem and um, saw the, uh, the main uh, tourist sites in Bethlehem and then, and then found our way back by bus. But it was a bit of an adventure. We're not sure quite where we were going or how we were going to get back, but uh, Paul was very interested as many people have said in, in, in religion and, and, and various other all sorts of things. So this this was a, a very nice experience that I remember with Paul. <clears throat> All right, uh, thank you, John. Uh, so I'm looking in chat to see if anybody else wrote anything. Uh, there is something from George Francis. George, uh, did you want to say something? And are you here? Yes, I'm here. All right. So oops, there we go. Very briefly, I uh, want to point out that Paul also enjoyed parties and dinners and dancing. And I caught a last picture of him in early 2020 before COVID shut everything down. And for your pleasure, I've posted it on the, on the chat as a picture of Paul as the uh, middle European count who for many years had his casket shipped to Urbana so that the Count could go dancing at our Mardi Gras. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you, George. Yes, I see the picture now. Uh, yeah, okay, very good. Um, all right. Uh, Anyone else who wanted to say something? So don't, don't be shy, now is the time. Please speak up. Yes, no, maybe. Okay. So um, I guess if there are no volunteers, uh, then... Uh, um, we can more or less adjourn here, or at least I can stop recording, and then if somebody uh, will, uh, um, uh, so let me stop there. So I, I think this will be at the, the end of the so-called, so to speak, official portion. So let me stop the recording. Uh, uh.